right, welcome everybody to another week of Garden Hour. My name is Amanda Bachman. I'm the Pesticide Education and Urban Entomology Field Specialist for SDSU Extension, and I'll be your host this evening. Also joining me tonight, we have Claudia Botsit, who is a nutrition field specialist uh, with us in the regional regional winter regional center. And Claudia, what are you going to be sharing with us tonight? Um, I'm going to be talking about our master food preserver program and then just a little highlight on canning for food preservation. Awesome. I cannot wait to hear about that and also ask you about the like canning kit that lives in our peer office that we'd love <laughs> for people to come check out. So I'm looking forward to visiting with you about this. And we also have Dr. Rhoda Burrows, who is with us from the Rapid City Center. Uh, Rhoda, what's on the agenda for this evening? I'm going to talk a little bit about raspberries, and then I'm going to talk about uh, maintaining your lawn during drought or just during the summer period. So. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I'm uh, maybe maybe due for another uh, mow, but we haven't had much moisture here in Pierre. And I'm going to be covering some insect updates and also some upcoming events that we have for you from the Hort team. And just a reminder to those of you that are out there watching us live, if you'd like to submit a question, please use the Q&A box, which if you're on a laptop or a desktop is going to be sort of at the bottom of your screen. If you're on mobile, you might have to hunt for that button a little bit more. But if you type your answer in there, we'll be able to answer it live or type a response back to you. And then keep an eye on the chat um, because that's where we'll share links with you, um, like how to reach us outside of Garden Hour or where to find some of the resources that our experts mention this evening. So thank you again for joining us. And Claudia, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, I will turn it over to you. All right, can we see it? Yep, looks good. All right, awesome. So like she said, I'm Claudia Botsit. I am a nutrition field specialist for extension. I'm fairly new, so bear with me here. You guys are some of my first people I'm talking to, but I think we will be good. So to start off, I'm gonna talk about um, food preservation and canning, and then I'm gonna get into um, our program we have. So food preservation is a way to keep the freshness of homegrown or locally purchased foods all year long. So I don't know um, how many people of you are big food preservation people, but I know growing up, I did it a lot with my mom and grandma. That's all we did every kind of fall, late summer. Um, and I loved it. And I loved being able to have our fresh spaghetti sauce and salsa all the time. So um, the normal shelf life for canned goods is about one year. They kind of say that's when it's best. You can eat it after the one year mark. Just want to make sure there's no discoloration or odor to it or even some new additives in the jar. Um, but overall, they last a fairly long time as long as the jar and lid is still sealed. Um, Depending on the acidity of your food is what determines if you're gonna use a water bath canner or a pressure canner. So a pressure canner is, it seals it and it cooks your food by pressuring very high temperatures. So in a pressure canner, you're gonna use um, low acid foods, which would be like your vegetables, um, spaghetti sauces and meats, if you ever preserve meat. Um, and again, lower acid foods, I'll talk about um, the special pathogen later, but um, this pathogen likes living in lower acidic environments. So that's why the lower acidic foods need to be canned in a pressure canner because the higher temperature helps eliminate this bacteria. And then our higher acidic foods, they can be um, canned in a water bath canner which is in the photo on the top right here. Um, and basically what that does is it just, you set it in there for the certain amount of time your recipe says, and you just kind of boil your product, pull it out, let it sit, and that's good. And the reason why you don't have to um, use the pressure canner for these is the certain pathogen, it doesn't like being in um, high acidic environments. It just can't survive there as well. So you just, 
I don't know how many people do it. I wish I could see hands, but I know most people who do food preserve are more familiar with the water bath canner. Um, and then one other thing I wanna add before I switch slides. Um, well, actually two things. Um, food preservation can be, or food preservation at home can be a lot cheaper than purchasing already preserved foods at the store. If you look at how much they cost versus your end product, canning at home is gonna give you a larger, a larger product for the amount of money you spend. And food preservation um, at home can also be a lot more nutritious. I know we're at the garden club, so I'm sure a lot of you guys um, grow your own fruits and vegetables or whatever it may be. And you're allowed to let your vegetable ripen on the vine. So like tomatoes, for example, you know your homegrown tomatoes are a heck of a lot better than the tomatoes you purchase at the store. And a lot of it is because they are homegrown. It's different than these mass producers, but we also are able to allow our tomatoes to ripen on the vine. So we pick them right when they're at the perfect, their peak ripeness. Whereas in the food industry, they have to pick it before it's ripe and transport it, especially all the way here to South Dakota. Um, so you're just not getting the nutrients it would versus if it was ripening to its peak on the vine. So that's a very cool thing. We love nutrients. Um, so then we're going to go to the pathogen I was referring to earlier, and it's Clostridium botulinum. I'm sure some of you guys have heard of this. Um, this bacteria causes botulism, which is a foodborne illness. Um, it is serious, but it's also very rare, especially if you use evidence-based recipes from Extension, SCSU, and other extensions, and follow the recipe and the method, you're going to be okay. Um, symptoms of Clostridium or Clostridium botulinum and toxin are as dizziness, blurry vision, and then GI issues such as stomach pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And one thing why this is highlighted in canning is because um, this bacteria likes living in anaerobic environments, which means no oxygen. So when we can stuff, we want to preserve it. We pull the oxygen out because oxygen depending on what it is, can cause rancidity and this bacteria can grow in it. So that's why we wanna make sure we are using the correct um, canning method, maybe a water bath canner or a pressure canner to make sure we are killing this bacteria so it won't grow and that will have a safe and good product. And the beans I have on here, they don't have the bacteria, but it's just, they're spoiled beans. So just keeping in mind where if your product doesn't look good, the best bet is to throw it out. So now we get to move on to the fun part, the Master Food Preserver Volunteer Program. So first I'm gonna kind of talk about what our volunteers get to do, and then I'll go into um, what it takes, like what they do to become master volunteers. So they get to do lots of fun stuff, as you can tell by these photos. So some of the things are our volunteers get to be a resource to their communities for food preservation questions. Anyone can reach out to them about canning jelly. Can I do this fruit? Can I do this? Um, they also get to run booths about preservation at farmers markets, fairs, or community events. They get to work with 4-Hers a lot, and they also get to judge um, food at county fairs. So that's pretty cool. And then they also can write articles for their newspapers on food preservation and post recipes and stuff like that. So to become a Food Master volunteer, we have online coursework that they're able to complete in their own time. And with that, you complete the training, which it's very easy reading stuff. So it's very easy to comprehend and learn how to do all the different food preservation matters. So I thought that was very cool. Um, so then they do a virtual training where they watch videos of our Hope and Megan, who used to be in my position. Um, and they have videos on canning, a um, bunch of different produce. So they have to do a virtual training. And then after that, they'll have to show me um, proper techniques. They can pick what they want to can, but they just have to show me that they are a master food preserver with and know that they need to use an evidence-based um, recipe so the pH is good and we know it's gonna be safe. 
and it's just very cool. We have nothing but good reviews from all our volunteers so far. But then another benefit of becoming a Master Food Preserver volunteer is we have preservation food kits. So we have five throughout South Dakota. We have one in Sioux Falls, Mitchell, Pierre, Aberdeen, and Rapid City. And in these food preservation kits, they have water bath canners, um, pressure canners. There are some jars in them, but they have cutting boards, um, bowls, knives, headspace measures. Like they have everything you need to can food. So they are very awesome kits. And that stuff is very expensive if you don't have it. So that is a huge benefit of becoming a volunteer for us. So here I just have some links that um, if you reach out, I'm not sure how I, but I can send you guys these links. Um, we have a Facebook page, which is very cool. There's lots of fun information. We actually have a volunteer running it right now. So she posts um, like recipes with produce that's in season or updates in certain, in the canning world or dehydrating world, all that good stuff. And then we do have a main food preservation page on extension, which that can give link you to the bottom links, which we have our volunteer page. So you can get more information on becoming a master food preserver volunteer. And then you also can apply on that if you're interested. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me too. But then this last link is probably one of the things I think is the coolest, the pick it, like it, try it, preserve it. And hope made it. Um, and it has like summer, fall, winter, spring, in-season produce. And you can click on whatever produce you want. There's a lot of options. And it gives you recipes for it, just like normal cooking. And then it also gives you recipes on how to preserve it. So it's just a very cool resource. And even if you're not into food preservation, I would just check it out because it allows you to see other information about food as well. So here's my email if you need to reach out to me at all. But now I think I'm open to questions. Awesome, thanks, Claudia. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions that came in for you. Uh, the first one is what specific foods should not be processed in a pressure canner? Um, pressure canner, you actually um, can process most foods because it's safe. Again, it kind of just depends. I need my notebook for this, but um, all recipes tell you if it needs to be done in a pressure canner or a water bath canner, but usually a pressure canner is always going to be a safe bet. You'll just have to know what pressure you need to set the canner to because you don't want to, sorry, the sun, you don't want to um, like overcook your thing and you also don't want to undercook your product. So a lot of it is just um, look at recipes and kind of see what it is, but lower acidic foods are usually meant for the pressure canner, but again, that's just because they're more at risk for getting the Clostridium botulinum bacteria, but most foods you can do in a pressure canner. Yeah, is there anything that like with the pressure, like any like risk of it, like kind of like just the texture wise, like it's possibly gonna like expand or get like a little bit screwy? Um, I don't think so, because it just depends, because the pressure is going to release the pressure from the can. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm not sure I'll have to look into that. <laughs> I've, I've made some occasional for my one foray into pressure canning was I canned venison. So I've like, yeah. I went straight from like vegetables to like pressure canning meat. It was quite the adventure. <laughs> um, let's see another question. Uh, what is the best way to can dried tomatoes? dried tomatoes and I have, feel free if you want to do some like searching while the rest of us are talking we can let you type an answer in for that one too okay. <laughs> yes that sounds good because I've never I mean I'm still learning everything but I have never heard about canning dried tomatoes so oh yeah can oh canning in oil specifically I'll let you do some research and type an answer to that one we'll okay. we'll get you guys a typed answer um, another question is the food preserving program going to expand into freeze drying? Um, possibly. I mean, I'm in charge of it now, so I think we have tried to look into it, but also SUSU Extension does um, 
everything has to be evidence-based. So it has to have science to know it's safe. And I don't think there's much research out on freeze drying yet. So I think that's why we haven't posted anything about it, but I'm sure in the future, more evidence-based information is going to come up. So we'll be able to hopefully eventually um, have some support on how to do that and stuff. Another question um, for somebody with a smooth top range, can you use a pressure canner safely on it? Yes, you can. Um, you want to make sure I have, I have a sheet for that, but I just, um, you just want to make sure um, the bottom of the like canner you're using isn't necessarily, isn't going to scratch it. And you also want to make sure that if you are removing the pan, you lift it straight up and you're not sliding it around the glass top, but otherwise, yeah, there, you can use them. Yeah, I was gonna say I'm like I totally pressure pressure canned on a smooth top <laughs> range, and yep, that's that's mm -hmm. the uh, that's the advice. You don't want to scratch just, it. Yep. Yes, you just don't want to damage it. So kind of yeah. just use it how you would use your other pots, but it is gonna be heavier because it's gonna have all the cans and water. Yeah. And that's why <laughs> if you do move it, you want to lift it straight up so it just doesn't yep. scratch the glass. Yep, can confirm. Gets a little weighty. Um, where can somebody get their pressure canner seal tested? Does SDSU do this service? Um, I'm not sure about the seal, but I do know we have resources to um, test your pressure gauge. Um, I'll have to look into that and get back about the seal. I'm not totally sure about that, but. Yeah, and I know just from my experience with pressure canning that, um, you know, it's it's a rubber seal. So you kind of just want to check to make sure it's not like brittle or cracked or, you mm -hmm. know looking kind of funky. And I mean, I had one that has like traveled with me from Pennsylvania, which is now almost 10 years and it was fine. <laughs> like it did great. Mm -hmm. I got a spare one because I thought there was no way that it was going to still be good. And it was, it was fine. So <laughs> yeah. Um, my mother was like, why are we canning venison again? And I'm like, I need the freezer space. <laughs> yeah. I've never <laughs> canned meat. So <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that looks like, okay, so it looks like our food preserving questions have slowed down. There's a couple for you to type responses to. Yeah. Um, so feel free to um, stop sharing on your screen and we will move to uh, Rhoda. And I know Rhoda, you've already got a question in there. So you can either start with that or end with it. Okay. Um, <laughs> I see you already flagged it. So I will go ahead and turn it over to you so we can hear about what's going on with raspberries and lawns. All right, I wanted to put this in for the raspberries. This is the time of year when they, they go out into your patch and you see maybe a third to half the, the stems are dying back. And if you haven't grown raspberries before, uh, rest assured uh, when they fruit like this, um, if they're summer bearing, uh, the canes die after they bear fruit. So that's exactly what they're supposed to do. Uh, it's a good idea if you have time uh, now to go in and cut out those old stems once the fruit is done bearing. Uh, it opens up the plant, gets more light and, and uh, more aer aeration through so that you get less plant disease in there, hopefully. But sometimes you'll go out and you'll see it's the not just the bearing canes, but also the new canes that came up this year uh, that will bear fruit next year and they're dying back. And you want to kind of look uh, if it's if it's dying from say about halfway up, it could be a raspberry cane bore and uh, uh, just prune those out again. Um, another thing that we do see on raspberry sometimes, fairly rare, but can happen is fire blight, like the fire blight on your apple trees. And sometimes you'll see kind of a crook at the end of the stem. It may not be quite as obvious as with, with trees, but if you see that, you know, it's a pretty good bet that, that you have fire blight. And again, just prune it out. Be sure uh, to clean your pruners between, sanitize your pruners between cuts. Um, 
anyway, uh, right now summer bearing should be about over with. Uh, and the fall bearing are going to start if they haven't. Uh, it's first of August. Uh, in a few weeks, the fall bearing raspberries will start up. So uh, I want to talk today some about irrigating your turf grass uh, during during a drought. And we've got several options here. One is to not water it. Uh, save your watering bill and your time. If you do this and you're in a place where you're just, you haven't gotten any rain for two weeks, go out and put in, put on it a quarter to half inch. We're not soaking it totally like we would do to bring it out of dormancy, but sort of just providing a sprinkling on the top just to put a little bit of moisture back into the crowns to keep them alive. They'll be dormant, but, but still alive. The other option, of course, is if you if you are watering, make sure you're watering deeply at a time. So put on a lot of water, make sure it's going down six, eight inches if possible, and then hold off for until the, the top couple inches dry out again. So what you're doing there is helping the roots to go down deep. And so they're going to be less susceptible when it gets to be a 100 degree day and then 30 mile per hour wind. It's going to have roots that still can reach down to water. And of course, another option is to uh, replace your Kentucky bluegrass with something that's more drought tolerant. Even fescues are more drought tolerant than bluegrass or uh, something like a buffalo grass or blue grandma. So some options to think about. I want to show you what happens when you, uh, and this is a soil core that was put down into the soil. I've, <laughs> I've turned it sideways here. Um, with frequent shallow irrigation, I know people that that is sprinkle their lawn every two days or sometimes every day. And that's just not necessary. And in fact, it's not very good for the lawn. What happens, you only go down, this would be about an inch across, only going down uh, an inch or two with the moisture and all the roots are going to stay up here because there's no reason for them to go down deeper. There's no water down there. So again, you get that hot, dry day, your sprinkler system goes down, uh, your lawn, your, your grass <laughs> dies because it doesn't have any access to water. If in, instead you do the, the deep irrigation, like we suggest, and this actually is a is a uh, looks like it's from a golf course because it's cut real short, but the roots go way down. We're looking at eight nine inches deep, and so they're going to be able to access that water uh, much more readily and may even be able to outlast some of the weeds that have shallower roots. So so. Deep and less often is the story for watering. For mowing, uh, mow it high and leave it lie is a good little saying to remember. Mow it high, leave it lie. Mowing at two and a half inches or more for any species on our northern grasses. Uh, three inches or more may do even better. And that helps it compete better with weeds as well. Uh, keep your mower blade sharp uh, so you don't have that ragged looking white <laughs> cast after you mow. And remember, the more shoot you have, the more roots. So if you're cutting it real low, like an inch and a half, that grass can support less root growth because it doesn't have the photosynthetic area to support those roots. So if you have a three inch high blade, your roots are going to go down much deeper. And again, they're going to be more tolerant to drought. 
So uh, should I bag or mulch my clippings? I watch a lot of my neighbors bagging their, their uh, lawn cl clippings and I think, man, that's a lot of work. So go ahead and fill out the survey that just popped up because I'm curious uh, what all of you are doing. Do you bag your lawn clippings and have the recyclers pick it up? Do you collect them and then use them as mulch around your home in your garden or, or flower beds? Or do you use a mulching mower and leave them on the lawn? And are we getting votes on that? Oh yeah, we're almost at like, we're like at 73% right now. So I'm just gonna okay. leave it in a little bit. Okay. So I'm, while that's going, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about what happens. Uh, first of all, grass clippings do not cause thatch buildup. Uh, some people bag their clippings because they're worried about thatch. They've heard about thatch buildup. No, it's not good for the grass. And so get those clippings off of there and, and remove them. Um, that actually is not the case. Clippings are about 90% water to start with. And they'll break down in about three to five days if you've got a healthy, healthy lawn and lots of bacteria around. So they'll uh, dry out and break down. Um, so they're not really contributing to thatch. Thatch is actually more a buildup of roots than anything else. And I see we've got 5% that recycle them, about a quarter of you. Use them as mulch in your in your uh, yard, and sixty what sixty eight percent are leaving them lie on the lawn. So, thank you. And another another thing to remember is clippings can return about a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year, which is about half the nitrogen that you would need to put on your lawn in a year uh, for relatively average maintenance program. Um, so you can save on fertilizer as well. OK, that's, that's enough about lawns. I wanted to do a bit of a plug for Farmer's Market Week and thinking about canning and preserving if you didn't grow enough of your own, uh, look for your local market and go out and, and uh, buy from your neighbors that still has that good fresh product uh, in the amounts that you need. So uh, this is Farmer's Market Week with an executive proclamation from from Governor Nome, and uh, so you can read that online if you want. Um, and if you're wondering, well, where do we have farmers markets in South Dakota? Uh, you can go to this special website. It's the South Dakota Specialty Producers uh, org farmers markets, um, and they have put a dot on each of the markets across the state. They also have a list, so you have an option of either clicking on the dot and it'll pull up the information for that particular market, or there's another li list that you can go to. Most of these markets have Facebook pages. Some of them also have websites that you can look at as well. And, and the two on the right are ones that I found, uh, Hot Springs, and I think the top one is Brookings. Uh, so there was some information for you there. A lot of times, you know, you can talk with the uh, with the vendors at the farmers market, and and a lot of them are pretty good growers. So if you have questions about growing something, and it's you know not a real busy time at the market, they are more than happy to visit with you and give you some of their tips for 
for growing as well. And they also tend to be good cooks. So if you're not quite sure how to fix something, they may give you some really good recipes as well. And that is it for me today, except for the uh, questions. Yeah, the early question that came in for you, Rhoda, was about when do you dig potatoes? How do you know when they're ready to be harvested? <laughs> and that's another good one to ask for the, the farmer's market, too. Um, one clue that, that new potatoes are beginning to form is when they get flowers on the top. So if you watch for those flowers and then uh, just dig a little bit, try just digging from one side and see if the potatoes are, are large enough that you want to dig them. Uh, from that time forward, uh, anytime you want new potatoes or you want smaller potatoes, you can go ahead and dig. If you want the potatoes to set skin, you really want to keep them around for a while because new potatoes don't have a skin that will allow them to keep. Uh, you let them die first and then wait about a week or so and then dig them. And when you say let them die, it's like let the green plant material die back, right? Right. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've got um, some in a container that, that uh, I've just decided that I'm going to stop watering and see what happens. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's a question about raspberries. What are some recommended raspberries to plant in Northeast South Dakota? Northeast. Uh, you can go either with the, uh, with the primal cane bearing. If you go with primal cane bearing, I do not recommend heritage, which is one of the older, uh, and primal cane is fall bearing, sorry. Um, I don't recommend heritage because it takes too long to come into bearing in the fall, but there are some, some of the other ones. Uh, and we do have a handout uh, on our website that gives you a description of all the different kinds of berries. Uh, Nova is a good one for summer bearing. Um, depends a little bit on what you're looking for as far as berries. Uh, when you'd like to come them to come into bearing, etc. Uh, autumn, autumn bliss, autumn Britain are a couple of the fall ones. I think there's some newer ones that have just come out recently, and and their names are escaping my memory right now. But and the the link to that raspberry uh, fact sheet is in the chat. So for folks who want to check that out, um, go to the chat and click on that link. There's a question about sugar baby watermelons. Uh, it stopped growing, um, just it's a little bigger than a grapefruit. What should they do to encourage growth? Or potentially, is that how big it gets? <laughs> <laughs> I grew watermelons one year in a part of my garden that I just kind of neglected to see what would happen. <laughs> I cut the most beautiful little baby melon that was about <laughs> this big <laughs> and it was really sweet but it was one that would normally be you know like a six pound melon or something <laughs> so, so you know if it's ready to harvest if it's stopped growing and it's ready to harvest if the tendril that's connected to the fruit turns brown so kind of look for that turn it over if the the bottom has a yellow ground spot or where it's resting on the ground turns yellow, then it's probably about as big as it's starting to get. Um, otherwise, if the plant is still healthy and it's not sizing up, my guess is that it's just needing some water and maybe a little bit more nitrogen. Uh, so we've got two questions that I think between the two of us, uh, we can tag team. One of them is about squash vine borer, which I know we both like wrote the email dissertations <laughs> about. Uh, but we've got uh, a garden infected with squash vine borer. It's impossible to grow squash. <laughs> um, I, I laugh darkly because I did um, an extensive amount of work in graduate school on 
three cucurbit pests, striped cucumber beetle, squash vine borer, and uh, squash bug. So anytime these questions come in, it takes me right back. Um, but they were told to hold off planting squash until late when the squash vine borer moth is done laying eggs. Would that work here in South Dakota? I guess I'm going to take this question because it's all about the bugs. Um, I'm going to go with uh, no, that won't work because squash vine borers will sort of emerge continuously and lay eggs continuously throughout the season. Uh, that gardener might have been conflating the advice for squash bugs, which yes, for squash bugs, if you plant later, the squash bugs in your area may have already colonized the early cucurbits instead of coming to yours. Not a guarantee, but that is a strategy. But for squash vine borer, sadly, that is not going to work. Um, one thing you may want to consider is using row cover over your squash plants. So transplant them, immediately cover them, um, and then only uncover them when you've got the first female flower, because um, at that point you need pollination. Um, and you might be able to you know, escape some of the squash vine borer damage. There are also squash vine borer pheromone traps. So you can put out a pheromone trap that will sort of collect the males and give you an idea of what kind of population you have. But honestly, cucurbits are so cheap at the farmer's market. <laughs> like for real, they take up so much space and they can be such a pain. Go support your local farmer's market. <laughs> Which is totally, I mean, after growing rows and rows of butternut squash and having to rip all the seeds out of them and count them, like this is what I do. I buy <laughs> one butternut squash a year because anything more than that will make me want to scream. Um, <laughs> also, the same with cantaloupe. I can eat one cantaloupe a year. <laughs> when you have gutted like hundreds of them, they just lose their appeal. <laughs> so yeah, clearly I have strong opinions <laughs> on <laughs> squash. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Um, but we do have uh, on potatoes, grasshoppers have been going after them. Should they leave the potatoes or just dig them up? If they're totally uh, defoliated, there's no leaves left, I would wait a few days and go ahead and dig them. Yeah, uh, once that green plant material goes away, it's like, yeah, they're not going to get any bigger. <laughs> <laughs> if it's like maybe a half the plant gone. Potatoes actually have this weird thing that, that the tuber can shrink and expand depending upon what's going on with the rest of the plant. And it can actually pull energy out of that tuber and put into new leaf growth. So by letting them regrow, unless you can unless the grasshoppers are gone for good, uh, you might actually be making your <laughs> tubers smaller. Yeah, yeah, the grasshoppers, I, they're my first, second slide, I think. Um, and then one last question on tomatoes, and we'll move on to some bug stuff. Uh, they've been picking tomatoes, uh, La Roma and Early Girl. They now have lots of green tomatoes, tomatoes set on, but few are turning red. Would it be okay to fertilize now? It would probably be okay. I don't think that's going to make them turn red, if that's the theory. Um, <laughs> it takes about a month once they set to go ahead and turn. So sometimes we look at that that tomato and thinking <laughs> it should have turned red two weeks ago. But <laughs> but try being patient. And if you're in an area where it's been pretty hot, that can delay it too. Yep. Yeah, so great, great questions this week. All right, I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see the grasshopper slide. Yes. Perfect. All right, yeah, so grasshoppers, I swear we didn't time that question, but uh, grasshoppers are getting pretty big and uh, getting pretty numerous in some parts of South Dakota, especially out west and here in the central part. You can see on the right, I have our two-lined 
uh, grasshopper, two-striped grasshopper, a very common species. And then on the left, a close-up of a different kind of grasshopper, just so you can kind of see the size of the head and the size of the mouth parts. A lot of people ask me if insects can bite. And let me tell you, grasshoppers, if they're annoyed with you and you're handling them, their mandibles are so strong and so sturdy that I've actually had them draw blood, like not because they're blood feeders, but just because their mandibles uh, can be that sharp. Um, they are voracious. They will eat anything that's green. So in parts of the state where maybe your garden is the only green thing, uh, my condolences at this point when they're this big, there's not much that's gonna stop them except for you know a guinea hen or a chicken. Uh, chemical controls at this point, they are big enough that they're mostly just going to laugh at them. And also, you know, we've got our plants actively flowering and, you know, you don't want to be impacting the pollinators and then, you know, nuking any sort of fruit uh, or vegetable production that way. So yeah, grasshoppers are out and about. If you're a bicyclist, I'm sure you maybe have run into some as they like fly into you off of the trail and um, yeah, they're getting pretty sizable so they can feel, you know, a little bit like a, uh, like a light bullet. But going from grasshoppers to sort of uh, my cool insects of the week, uh, last week was the week for click beetles, apparently. Click beetles are beetles, order Coleoptera. They're in the family Elateridae. And they can be a garden sort of pest concern because their larvae are what we call wireworms. And I should have put a picture up here of their, of their larvae, but that's not the the type of click beetle I was seeing this week. I was seeing the adults. Uh, but the larvae are soil dwellers. They're sort of a long and smooth, almost like, you know, a mealworm sort of looking critter. And they can be a problem uh, if you're growing potatoes or carrots. And I think Rhoda, I think we had an email this week that was a picture of a uh, uh, click beetle larva damaged potato. They can sort of like drill sort of like perfect circular holes in it. Um, and sometimes the only defense against those is making sure that you rotate your crops to kind of get away from some of those soil dwelling pests. But the adults can be pretty cool. The one on the left here is the Eastern Eyed Click Beetle. It's actually one of our largest beetles in the state. Um, this one showed up in my office, gifted from a friend. It was still alive, so I put it back outside, but it was about as big as my thumb. Um, and obviously the larva of this one is not what's gonna be messing around in your garden. Uh, the larva of the Eastern Eyed Click Beetle are gonna be in, um, in the forests, in like rotting stumps and you know that kind of environment. Um, and you can see like the eye spots on the back of the thorax are sort of this like velvety black color. Um, so that's a, you know, a defense against predators. And then a sort of more standard click beetle over here on the right. But how they get their name is if you flip them over, they have a protrusion from their thorax that kind of hooks into their abdomen that they'll sort of pop up. And then as it sort of unhooks, um, it, you know, allows them to like click and flip over. So if you do run across a click beetle, um, if you hold it by the abdomen, it'll sometimes like try to click the thorax to um, escape. So you can like feel the click that way, or you can flip it over and see if it'll do the trick for you. I tried a lot to get the one on the left to like do the click for me so I could film it and like share it on Garden Hour, but it was shy and instead just spent a lot of time playing dead. So sadness there, but they're really cool. Uh, this is about the third or fourth um, Eastern Eyed Click Beetle that I've run across in South Dakota. So we have them sort of all over the state, but they are, uh, they are big and you do need some trees in order for them to show up. Still with the cicada killer wasps, um, still getting loads and loads and loads of questions about these. Um, again, they're still not murder hornets. <laughs> Um, I did have an interesting variation on the theme today, a uh, caller who had um, some, you know, some sort of mammal, you know, maybe like badger, skunk, whatever, actually dug up the cicada killer nests, I think, in order to eat the cicadas that had been provisioned there. So that was sort of the first time I heard of some secondary damage from mammals um, because of cicada killers. Um, 
obviously this isn't something that necessarily happens super frequently and it's I would not consider it a reason to try to manage cicada killers but much like how you know raccoons and skunks will maybe dig up lawns for grubs similar strategy they were going after the cash cicadas I mean you know why climb up in a tree and try to hunt them yourself when the cicada killer has made you a buffet line under somebody's row of shrubs so that was a that was kind of a a new new observation with cicada killers this week. And a critter that is an arthropod, but not an insect, um, are isopods, also known as roly polies, pill bugs, sow bugs. They have many different common names. I should have put up the poll question of like, what do you call these critters? Um, but these are actually terrestrial crustaceans. We have them all over South Dakota. They thrive in moist, dark, damp places. Um, they are decomposers. So if you have a compost pile or maybe a wood or a brush pile, you'll find them there. Um, they are pretty, they're, they're harmless. Um, they don't do anything to people. They, you know, provide a valuable service, you know, breaking stuff down in your compost pile. Sometimes folks will find them wandering into houses or garages, but usually it's so dry inside that they'll dry out and die pretty quickly. So not something that you need to worry about managing. Um, and there are some of them that when you pick them up, they will do the little roll up into a ball thing, which is um, kind of adorable. And I love it when things do what the internet tells me they're supposed to. Um, so the, that was one of my finds this week as I was uh, watering my plants, because here in Pier, we got like a grand total of like six tenths of an inch of rain um, over the weekend. So enough to maybe keep my lawn alive, but not growing. Um, so I found these isopods were had a pretty healthy colony in my little like watering station. So where the watering cans and drugs kind of overflow, they were uh, doing very well there. And I did want to share some upcoming events with folks. Um, this Saturday, I will be in Sioux Falls at the Sertoma Butterfly House for Bugapalooza, along with um, some other groups that are going to be down there. It will be outside, so fingers crossed for some decent weather. Um, and then I know Christine and Dr. Ball and myself will all be at the state fair at various times. Um, so that is in Huron, South Dakota from September 1st through 5th. Um, and like, for instance, I'm talking on the Thursday and Friday. I believe Christine's there on Friday. John might be there on Saturday or Sunday. Um, but there will be an agenda, um, you know, with the schedule of the talks for each day that's going to be going out. So if you are near the Huron area or just want to come by the state fair. Uh, keep an eye out for the Hort building presentation schedule because we will sort of all be there at various times. And the master gardeners will be there as well for the whole fair um, in that building with resources and able to answer your questions. So keep an eye out for that. And then uh, Insect Fest is September 10th um, from 10 to 2 in Brookings. And so that one will just kind of, you know, keep getting plugged up until the end of garden hour. So with that, I'm going to stop my share here and see what we've got for questions. Okay. So I knew I had a question up here about um, city mosquito sprays and dropping of tomato blossoms. There is no correlation with, between that. <laughs> My guess is based on the high temperatures <laughs> that that is what is causing blossom drop. Um, and it just happens to be coincidence that it's um, lining up with um, mosquito sprays. The adulticide um, sprays are not necessarily insect wise selective only to mosquitoes. Those are fairly broad spectrum products, but how they're applied is what makes them selective. Uh, them being applied after dusk um, when other, you know, when insects, you know, like pollinators are not active or not as active is one of the ways that we can help target only mosquitoes. Um, communities like Sioux Falls and I believe Aberdeen do a great job of putting information about their mosquito control programs on their city websites. I know in the case of Aberdeen, you can actually look and see what products they're applying and you can read those product labels to learn more about what's being used. Um, so, but it's not causing your tomato blossoms to drop. <laughs> And then let's see, how big do cicada killer nests get? So cicada killers are solitary. Uh, so one female will provision a nest and she might put, you know, three or five or 10, depends on how sort of successful she is at hunting. Um, but they're not, 
they're not a visible nest. You'll really only see the entrance hole, which is about maybe not quite an inch um, in diameter. Um, so that's really the only part of that that you're going to see. It's not like a, you know, a hornet or, you know, a visible like wasp nest or, you know, like the mud daubers or the paper wasp where you can see the comb or anything like that. That's not what um, the cicada killer nests are like. Um, you may have multiple cicada killers in one area if you've got, you know, sort of the favorable soil, but it's not like a, a honeybee hive that's got the cells and, you know, a whole bunch of them working together. It's just each individual female is doing her own thing. Um, so yeah, those were all of my bug questions. Claudia, were there any uh, food preservation ones you wanted to circle back on or did you get everybody? <laughs> um, I think I got everyone because I know I reached out about the smooth stove top and you can do it, but it's just not recommended because it can cause damage. And a lot of them have built in like heat measures. So once it reaches a certain heat, it'll shut off, which that can really interfere with the whole canning process. So it's kind of just not recommended. I know someone commented to use a, I forgot what she said. Uh, like a Coleman, like a camp stove yeah. or a. Which I guess a, you a could burner. always use that. Or go borrow a friend or family's kitchen, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I think we are caught up on questions, so we'll give folks maybe a quick minute or two. If there's any lingering questions for us this week on Garden Hour, feel free to type those in. Oh, we got one. Will a cicada killer nest kill the grass? No, the drought will kill the grass. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cicada killers, I mean, the area where they hang, like, you know, you'll have that hole, you might have a mound of dirt that you can, you know, just kind of like knock down like you would if earthworms were, you know, being pyramid builders. Um, but it's, they're, they're not root feeders or anything like that. Um, it's really just, you know, a little bit of cosmetic damage in the area where they've made the hole. Um, the much bigger threats to lawns in South Dakota right now are the lack of moisture. <laughs> <laughs> and in my in my yard, um, just how good Kosha is at surviving. So apologies to my neighbors. <laughs> um, but yeah, we will be uh, back here next week, the 16th. So we've got the 16th, the 23rd, and the 30th. So we've got three more weeks of Garden Hour this year. You can always check our archives on the YouTube channel um, and do make sure to come back for these last three weeks and send in your questions. Uh, we've got one for you, Rhoda. When is a honeydew melon ripe on a trellis? I'm getting a little, a little fidgety here with my controls. No, I wasn't going to run away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honeydew, I believe, is one that does not slip, and so you have to kind of look for uh, a little bit of a softening of the skin. Uh, some people can see a color change. Um, you may be able actually to smell it if you've got a, a sensitive nose. <laughs> you, you can smell that honeydew smell a little bit better. Um, so those are or three things to kind of look for. And then uh, for apples, how effective is the kale and white clay in controlling apple maggots and codling moths? What I've read is that it's, it's you won't get 100% control, um, but it, it's better than nothing. <laughs> so it might be something like 50% or <laughs> It's, yeah. it's really hard to keep that on there and get 100% coverage. Yeah, and especially as it rains too, um, that will also wash it off. So it's definitely something that can be part of your management for those pests, but you should also look into the things like the 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 pheromone, like the traps or like the, the decoy apples with the um, tanglefoot or whatever, you know, it's, it's not going to be 100% on its own. I found when I tried it that it needed a sticker spreader uh, that that otherwise it did not 
give good coverage. Mm -hmm. And I was trying it on very small apples. Remembering, remember with culling moth, they can start striking as soon as that apple begins to form. So you have yeah. to get in there really early. Yeah. Yeah. And if you bag your apples, like one of our uh, question, uh, one of our folks last week, you could end up with a bag full of earwigs. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like some people's uh, version of a nightmare uh <laughs> go with one more question uh granddaughter would like to know why there's a lot of spider webs in the lawn because there's a lot of spiders <laughs> uh, there can be a surprising number of spiders in turf that are out there hanging out doing their thing you know eating insects that are out there I am very pro spider and especially if you have mornings where you've got some dew formation that can also really highlight spider webs um, and so you might not have you know noticed them before but when you've got dew then suddenly you know they're they're everywhere um, I've been you know driven some you know, state highways and gravel roads doing some grasshopper surveys a couple of years ago. And there was one like really dewy morning. And it was just incredible how many spider webs were out there in the ditches. So lots of spider webs. You got a lot of spiders. Um, <laughs> so Amanda, do they hear the lawnmower and go deeper or do they get crunched up by the lawnmower? No, I think uh, honestly, a lot of insects get out of the way. Um, even grasshoppers will you know, take off. And a lot of those spiders, the web that you see, um, a lot of our like grass spiders are sort of like a funnel web hunter where they'll actually be at the very, the spider itself is at the very bottom. And so the visible part of the web, you know, the spider's not out there like patrolling on the top. It's down there waiting at the bottom for something to get caught and then it's going to come out and grab it. So yeah, no, they're, they're pretty well protected. I mean, another reason to, you know, set your mower high, you don't want right. to, I mean, my, my worst fear is I'm going to run over like a rabbit nest or something like that's like, ugh. <laughs> so yeah, set that mower high for a lot of reasons. <laughs> I watched a garter snake just barely oh. miss my mower the other day. <laughs> yeah, I, oh. I mean, I try to pick up like the sticks and stuff out of my yard. So that's another reason to keep it high. So, I, you know, the ones that I miss, I don't totally, you know, dull my blades every time, but but yeah, no, great questions this week, everybody. Uh, Claudia, any parting words of wisdom before we sign off tonight? Um, I don't think so. Just thanks for having me. And I hope I was able to answer everyone's questions. I answered them to the best of my knowledge. So, <laughs> Well, welcome to SDSU Extension. And now folks, uh, they've got a, you know, a face to go with the name and you know can always reach out to you. And I'd love to see people come to Pier and check out the Canon kit because it is really sweet. It does have everything. <laughs> yes, they're um, very cool kits. So. Yeah, so hopefully get the word out about those. Rhoda, any any last words for this evening? Cut it high and let it lie. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Good motto. Yeah, and mine is like, it's still not a murder hornet, guys. <laughs> still not a murder hornet. Thank you again to our panelists and to our audience for asking such great questions. We will be back with you again next week on August 16th. Same time, same place. So until then, happy gardening. <laughs>